Einen wunderschönen guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen good zur 24. Außenpolitischen Jahrestagung der Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Ich freue mich, Sie hier unsere Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer im Livestream äh, zu begrüßen. Der Titel äh, unserer diesjährigen außenpolitischen Jahrestagung lautet Europa verteidigen in ungewissen Zeiten. Und äh, Sie sehen jetzt hinter mir unter anderem einen Hashtag, der heißt We need EU. We need you. Ähm, und dieser Hashtag wird uns die nächsten Monate auch begleiten. Diese Veranstaltung ist eine von mehreren Veranstaltungen und Publikationen, die wir zu Europa-Fragen machen in diesem Jahr der europa on Europe in the year of und the European elections. This will be our focus. And over the next months, und we will also zu so Themen have conferences and publications on topics like the EU reform and enlargement, democracy, eines so protection of democracy in view of a possible shift to the right at the elections, future of the Green Deal, and also assessment and evaluation, rather, of the European elections. So please consult our website regularly or follow us on social media in order to be up to date all the time. So we will start with an initial talk with the Minister of State for Europe and Climate, Anna Lührmann, and then I will conduct a short online survey with you. And it would be great if you at home and also here would take out your smartphone and over there you can see that we also have Wi-Fi and the respective password. You will need it in approximately 30 minutes from now when I ask you respective questions. Without further ado, I would like to start now and I would hand the floor to Jan Philipp Albrecht, our co-president, and Anna Lührmann, our Minister of State, for an initial discussion and welcome and enjoy the 24th Foreign Policy Conference. Well, ladies and gentlemen, also from my side, a warm welcome to the Heinrich Böll Foundation, uh, to this year's foreign policy conference. We are quite happy about the huge interest here in this room, but also, of course, the audience in the live stream. And I'm quite happy that um, at the beginning we have the opportunity to talk with Minister of State for Europe, Anna Lührmann, um, security and defense policy, or the, the issue of security and defense policy as an additional issue is under discussion in this year of European elections. We have enormous tasks ahead of us, like the migration question, which is a huge topic, and also the continuation of the Green New Deal, as well as the returning um, question of the rule of law, but also the issue of the European security and defense. Um, so it's <coughs> obvious, but it's also relevant in view of the fact that we do not only have European elections, but also we have the elections in the United States. And um, I think I read it in Politico. Some people even say that the election would be even more relevant than the elections to the European Parliament. Um, I would doubt that, but still, it's quite relevant election, the election in the US, which forces us to look into the issue. Romano Prodi, the former EU Commission president, 20 years ago in 2004 said he has a vision of the EU which is would only be surrounded by friends. I mean, May the 1st, 2004, uh, EU enlargement, we still remember that. This is a vision that we all pursued and which was the guiding principle for all of us. But still, we have to say today that um, instead of a ring of friends, we also have an arrow of instability, at least also in part of the European Union, which goes from the Baltic Sea to via Eastern Europe to the Southern Caucasus and to the Middle East. And in view of the relevant U.S. elections, we can say that Europe is well, demand it to uh, commit itself, to engage itself, but also to question uh, its own 
capabilities of self-defense and um, ability to act. So decisions need to be taken more quickly. We have to make sure that there is stability in neighboring countries, and we also have to come to a better arrangement with veto nations. Just think of the Hungarian blockade when it comes to the help for Ukraine. So that much at the beginning. And this leads us to the question, how can we do it also in view of structures? And you, dear Anna Luermann, together with the French Minister of State, your colleague, at least so far, um, I mean, you have to inform us how this will continue. Laurence Bourne in France, you have commissioned a working group how the EU can achieve and can come to uh, decisions quicker. This seems to be a central issue. So what are the most important results of your work so far? Well, thank you very much, dear Jan. And indeed, I have been longing for a new St Minister of State for Europe in France. Laurence has been out of office for two weeks now, and I have the impression that my right hand has been amputated because it was quite natural for me to have a close cooperation with her and coordinate with her in view of questions that are on the council agenda. And at the moment, I have the strong feeling that I do not have a counterpart, and I hope that um, there will be a new person in that position so that we can continue our important work. And and indeed, a year ago, we commissioned an expert group to think about how we can prepare the EU for enlargement and the kind of reforms that we need to be uh, capable of acting when we have more than 30 members, for example, because um, much of what is quite difficult already with 27 members, like the special summit in Brussels, which has only been summoned due to Viktor Orban. And these minor things can become actually a real obstacle uh, in an EU with more than 30 members. So one of the key issues is also the result of the report that we have to deal with a veto right. There are quite a few creative proposals, how we can make sure that also the interests of small and medium-sized member states are still being heard and taken into account. And what is even more fundamental is that we become better in defending the fundamental values of the EU because the values are not only attacked from outside, from Russia, but also from the inside, from the right-wing populists, uh, right-wing extremists and parties and actors. And so we as an EU have to be quicker and more targeted when it comes to defending these values against these attacks. And um, this is also the lesson that we can learn from the um, dealings with Viktor Orban. So the EU has woken up way too late. And much of what we see today is also expression of the uh, same key issue, which is that Hungary has deviated so far from our common values. And this is why we see problems at different levels. For example, when it comes to the support of Ukraine, which is also the support of uh, to a country which defends our values, but also an ex accession of Sweden. Just imagine an EU member state blocks another EU member state to be part of this protective umbrella. This is difficult to understand. So um, rule of law, protecting our values is a very important aspect. And then, of course, we also have to take the whole um, <clears throat> issue of size of the parliament, size of the commission, um, working procedures, etc. However, the most fundamental thing is the protection of our values and also the question of the possibility to act. So our political generation is or has actually started out with the Constitutional uh, Convention, Joschka Fischer, with, with his famous speech. And the question is, what do we re have to reform? Um, and there have been many reforms and the Constitutional Treaty that led to the Lisbon uh, Treaty. Um, but still, we have to say that much has not been regulated in the treaties in order to, for example, prevent these kind of veto positions or in order to come to better capability to act. So what of the things that the Commission has worked on is actually focused on um, implementing this in the course of the treaties 
and also via the increased cooperation, which is already possible now? Or where do you see the need after 20 years to um, actually start out with a new and amended treaty. Well, at the convent, I was part of the youth convent, and I represented the Green Youth at the time, and later on also in the German Bundestag, I was the rapporteur of the convent, and I closely monitored what Joschka Fischer did at the time, and we had a close exchange, and, and deep in my heart, I'm a European Federalist, and I'm dreaming of a closer cooperation in Europe, of coming closer together and an ever closer union, um, and I do also consider symbolisms very important and also the constitutional treaty. And I think it also gives um, support to people and also orientation. But what I also see is the discussion that I have with many colleagues from other member states where the issue of a treaty amendment is actually like a red flag. So when I came to the um, General Council, we also tried to implement the results of the future convent where we had this huge citizens' participation two years ago and to seize the momentum in order to also come to an amendment of the treaty in the General Council. And I think only five member states signaled that they were open to an amendment of the treaty. And policy, of course, or politics is always the art of the things that are feasible. So there's only very little appetite to actually try to achieve this major change. So um, this means that we have to try to find ways in order to circumvent these uh, blockades in a different way. And the Lisbon Treaty allows us a lot of flexibility in this regard. For example, the Passarelle Clause, um, it means that in the Council we can simply, so to speak, through a unanimous decision but without um, treaty amendment or ratifications in certain areas of the foreign and security policy can come from uh, the principle of unanimity to uh, the principle of majorities. And we have set up a group in the Foreign Ministers' Council, uh, which Annalena is um, uh, looking into, and also in other areas. We try to get small steps ahead. And this is where we realistically, from my point of view, can motivate other states to go along. And this is why we also commissioned the expert group to work on scenarios for a changing or amendment of the treaties for a convention, but also below that level. And there are def different things that we can do here. And we also have the option that if we enlarge the EU in the course of the enlargement treaties, we can also implement certain amendments in the treaties. So the realistic scenario is that we go into that direction, even though I myself would like to see a um, constitutional convention and an amendment of the treaties. Well, with a view to the joint uh, security and defense policy, of course, it will be a special challenge as this is considered a key issue by the member states. So in how far in these council meetings do you feel that stronger cooperation is indispensable in this area? And in how far people discuss rather the symbols or smaller items like the European army, or will there also be other aspects that will be put onto the agenda? Well, we do not lack political statements and uh, statements on the, the willingness to increase the cooperation in the foreign and security policy. And we also discussed a lot that as Europe, we have to become more sovereign. This was also the result of the French presidency. So these are also the well-meaning final statements of the council where we uh, embody it. But the thing is what derives from it. And Hannah is laughing in the first row. So how can we conduct a common analysis? This is also what you started with. I mean, 20 years ago, we thought that we would be surrounded by friends. But now we find out, no, there is a circle of insecurity around us. So this is a completely different uh, security policy situation in which we are at the moment. And um, so sometimes I'm wondering whether 
we are, have really woken up in Europe, whether we have really understood uh, and how far we are challenged to really deal with our own security. And it doesn't matter who eventually wins the U.S. elections. The thing is, and, and Joschka said it at the time, and one of you, one of the other of you might still remember it, and I hardly can impersonate him, but he said, well, we can not change our geographic uh, location. So we are in Berlin, approximately 800 kilometers away from the Polish-Ukrainian border. And um, this means that it's quite clear. We have to make sure that we and our allies can be defended by us against Russia. And I think this has not yet reached many people's minds. For example, when we look at it, and this is also a topic that is being uh, talked about a lot, um, when we look at NATO as the alliance for collective security and that we strengthen the European part in it, of course, but the EU has a stronger and stronger role when it comes to um, purchasing um, arms, for example, so the armament. So it doesn't make sense to have 27 member states individually ordering ammunition, for example, um, possibly for 27 different systems. And when they come to Ukraine, nothing is compatible. So in Ukraine, it's a huge logistical task to find out. Uh, and I mean, I'm not a military expert, but um, in part, there are like um, firearms <coughs> of the same type, but depending on the country from which they come, they need different types of ammunition, and it cannot be. Um, so in Europe, we have to purchase these things together and develop an arms industry together in a way that we are not dependent from others. And to say this, of course, is also difficult for me because for a long period of time, I have worked towards a world where I thought this would not be necessary. But of course, we have to accept reality and have to accept that this is the way it is. And we have, to, and I had just an exchange with some colleagues here um, in the um, Baltic states, uh, and there the threat is even more palpable. This is why we send a whole guard there um, and troops there. But what we are doing with the ammunition uh, procurement is too slow when it comes to Ukraine, and we have to become better here. Well, I think this has been become apparent to everyone, and uh, from the former view of a um, state minister, <clears throat> I can only say that it's necessary to coordinate this in an um, overall manner. Um, this question moves to the background if I have to decide whether the next ship is going to be built in Kiel or elsewhere. So we need a government that takes this into perspective. And do you have the opinion or the idea that the common interest is moved to the front of the stage? We see um, Kallas uh, who um, advertises this. Is that uh, being picked up in the member states, including our, ourselves? What do you see there? Well, I think, <clears throat> as I've just said, everybody agrees to the same goal on a superficial level, that we have to do more together, we have to invest together, and so on. But um, everybody understands that this means that their own industry should benefit from this. And this is a fundamental problem. And to be honest, we have this in our coalition. We uh, all agree that we shouldn't quarrel so much in public, which means the other party should uh, stop it. And uh, this is a bit of a problem, which we always have. And this is why I think we need better structures. And I think it's good that we move forward with France here. We have a number of joint um, military projects here, the tank project, for example. And here, we see, we see some difficulties step by step, which uh, um, create communication, uh, which, which, which needs policy and politics to uh, solve communication problems between the involved companies. And uh, this is the kind of approach of looking and checking whether the given targets can be delivered or not. 
the question whether one can agree in these simple core tasks and move this forward is important because there are bigger challenges with bigger groups awaiting uh, in the EU. Uh, we are talking about the extension, for example, soon we want to have Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia in the midterm. And uh, so these three countries are in this arc of instability, which we've just mentioned. And we also see in all three countries uh, Russia as a de facto power on the territory. So can these countries join the EU if um, there is a Russian presence in these countries? Well. In our, it's in our geostrategic interest to uh, invite them and um, uh, integrate them into the EU as soon as possible. That's why we're starting here in the negotiation. This applies for the Western Balkan as well. And that's why we're negotiating here. And this afternoon, I will uh, meet Olga Shefin Vishanefia, the um, Deputy Minister, Prime Minister of the Ukraine, uh, to see how far they are moving already in the different areas. And the difficult or the urging task for now is that the EU, the Commission, and the member countries support these countries in order to carry out these reforms and that these countries will undertake the effort to make these reforms as well. And if we still stick with that problem with the areas that are not under direct control, that's a problem we'll need to solve. Uh, so I'd rather follow the approach to cross a bridge when we get there, which is what we've done in the past. Looking at Cyprus here, the solution was that um, the uh, treaty applies for these areas which are under uh, European control. So that's not a good solution, but it is something uh, that one could look at if the problem persists. You've talked about Balkan, and here the situation in Bosnia or Kosovo is tense. And uh, doesn't the West Balkan move too far into the background? amidst all this discussion? Should it be moved forward? Well, it needs to. This is why we're doing a lot. We have the Berlin process there. We uh, meet with the governmental levels uh, in officials and consultations together to make sure that the countries can integrate amongst themselves and uh, reduce borders and find a better way into the EU. And uh, we have to make concrete offers. That's why the EU has presented a growth panel, a growth package. Uh, Ms. von der Leyen has gone to Sarajevo. So the political attention is there. There was a peak briefly. I'm going to Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro next week. The problem we have there is two things. One is that in some countries, Macedonia, for example, the EU unfortunately connects the process of joining with or has been blocking it with um, requests that are not really relevant. I think if you're involved in the matter, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then the other countries, especially in Serbia, unfortunately, um, President Vucic has taken many, many, too, too many steps away from the EU. Uh, so we have a uh, population who wants to go um, into the EU, which uh, is something that, well, they start even saying, if the EU doesn't come to us, we'll come to the EU, which is something we benefit from. But ideally, the people would like to stay in their home countries, so, which is... Um, uh, for example, in the elections in December in Serbia, which had things happening like people being moved with coaches to uh, poll stations in Belgrade who didn't live there, which was clearly criticized by observers. This is not mature for a country that wants to join, join the EU, and that's uh, a central problem. We see similar things happening. Uh, we see that the um, 
uh, accession process is uh, blocked in Bosnia Herzegovina from many sides, and so this is why we lack a bit of dynamics here. And as the EU, I think we really have to make clear to communicate in the region we want you, but uh, precondition is that you really have uh, that your government really does um, democratic reforms in your countries. That's a challenge we see everywhere. And to finish off with, let me give you a, a question on the paper. Uh, this paper talks about the concentric circles in the EU. You can call that different ways, different speeds. Is that an inner circle? But uh, it's quite clear and there is a group of states that are moving forward, and there's all members, and around it, there are sort of the associated states and uh, the um, international uh, political community of the EU. So what is the relationship between all of these? And the question is also, where is Germany in all of this? Well, in this paper, which um, a number of experts have been involved to write, uh, so I wouldn't really assign under every line uh, of it. But there was a part which had a good, uh, nice graphic of these uh, concentric circles. And uh, the scientists said, had they known that so many people, when they looked at the paper, concentrated on that, they would have put it differently, because that was not their core point, uh, that one should think about the um, delimited uh, areas. They wanted to make sure and clear that there is different levels of integration with the political community that opens a space, for example, for informal political talks with countries who can't be in the EU because they don't fulfill the criteria or they don't want to, like Great Britain. I think for t today, that's an interesting point for the discussion. How can we manage to uh, maybe get a bit closer with uh, uh, the UK in the given situation. I think they're an important partner, and that's something we should spend a thought on. And it's uh, this is a kind of a forum then where one can actually discuss these international and strategic questions and security questions as well. Uh, I rather personally would call, call this something like flexigration, flexible integration rather than fixed concentric circles or core Europe kind of discussion. That's a 90s a discussion from the 1990s to me, where we had fixed national positions, whether you want more or less integration. Today, I think we rather have the issue that in all member states, including ourselves, our own, we have political parties and actors who want less EU and even want to leave, leave like AFD. And, uh, so this is why I think we have to look for solutions that can react if these kind of actors uh, get to power to not stop the whole EU. So we have to get some flexibility in and be faster and quicker, for example, for um, uh, trespassing the law. And uh, well, I'm coming to an end. Time is uh, ending. So. Uh, it, I think it's an important point that we move towards this topic with a certain openness, saying if there is a group of states who want to move further, for example, in arms procurement, in international security politics, as we've seen in the discussion in the Red Sea, um, France, uh, uh, Spain stood back uh, and leaving the way free for others. And these are kind of flexible models, which I could imagine. I don't think that we have to establish a fixed core group who does uh, this for always and ever. Uh, the good thing about a good corporation, it says that it must be open to everyone. And as Germany, to answer your question, is is uh, we want to, of course, be on the part who, of the people who look for common European solutions, who try to integrate as many European countries into as many political goals and creating uh, security and stability in Europe together. Anna, thank you very much and great success in your tasks.
And I think uh, there is a number of points that we can take into the discussion now. And I hand back to Georgiou. Thank you, Anna Lerman and Jan. Before we go into the details of the discussion, I would like to invite you as the audience to a small online survey. You can participate here in the room as well if you're online. And for that, I'd like to ask you first to take your smartphone and if you can scan this QR code. I doubt if it will work. If it works, great, wonderful. Uh, if not, if you want to take the uh, the uh, manual version, just enter menti.com and the code that you see below, and then you'll see a number of questions which may confuse you to start with. But I would like to build the discussion up on these. So, first, the first question is a topic that has been announced, do you agree with the long-term goal of a, an EU army? Yes or no? Please vote now. And I'll leave it running for a while to see if we can pick up a trend, which we can already see quite clearly. And uh, so that is clear. The trend goes towards a majority saying, as a long-term goal, the goal could be a U EU army, and that is a desirable goal. Thank you so far. And let's look at the next question, which has quite something to it, which means, does the EU need its own nuclear deterrent? I <clears throat> gave you three options. Yes, the EU needs its own nuclear deterrent. No, it doesn't. Or the third, it depends, uh, quote unquote, Trump. And the trend is interesting here that, well, my impression at least is that uh, a third said yes, a third says no, and uh, a third. Uh, says it depends. I, a question like this in a green environment is a notable result. And I think this is something that we'll have to drill down into. The next question is, should we discuss the issue of nuclear deterrence in the EU at all? It, does it make sense to have this discussion? And here, Yes, surely, in any case, is in front. I've just read, I've just heard this is nothing that uh, I only get. I have other voices as well that I listen to. So this is why I think, interestingly, here, uh, most say that this is a deb debate to have, although it's not a simple debate for Greens. Six are saying no under no circumstances, and 10 are saying only if the U.S. nuclear umbrella is at stake. And we're going to talk about that. So a clear trend as well. Now, a question. Uh, take your time to ponder about it for a while and study the answers first. What should be priorities of a green security order? What's the first thing that you think of as priorities? And the options are establish a post-national European Defense Union, something like the EU Army, the support, the support the European strategic autonomy, so Europe as an international player. Uh, the priority and the third question should be to protect vulnerable European countries against aggression. And. The last one, disarmament, uh, there should be a core of the peace project uh, in Europe and the green project may be disarmament and peaceful conflict resolution. Um, well, what surprises me a bit here is that the European strategic autonomy seems to be up front here. All the other points are seem to be equaling out a bit, and I would say that um, 
There are going to be more questions. We see the green bar raising as well. Uh, still, disarmament and peaceful conflict resolution. Thank you so far for these answers. And uh, that kind of lays out the field which I would like my guests in, uh, invite my guests to tour Zegela Dalinsky, Lukas Polesa, and I also ask Ulrika Franke. Uh, she is live with us online from. Paris. So, Sergey and Lucas, Lucas, please join us here up on the stage. <clears throat> and we will have a bilingual discussion here. Lucas and Ulrike are going to speak in English, and uh, Sergey, you speak German. And if you want to listen to the interpretation, we have some headphones at the entrance. So just maybe one fundamental comment, if you are confused about the questions. For this session, we will allow the luxury of some fundamental questions, which may be a bit of a bit away from daily politics. We don't have Euro Eurobomb, we don't have a EU army, but we will take the luxury to discuss this. We will get a bit closer to the daily politics in the next sessions, what happens with Trump wins and so on. We're in for that, but now for the time being, we will stick with the fundamental questions. And I'd like to start with you, Ulrike. Concerning the EU army, on a website you have wrote a, written an article and you've said the discussion on a European army is not helpful at this moment. And my question is, why is the discussion not helpful? And you put up some operative problems in case this should be implemented. Uh, Ulrike Franke from Paris, I'm happy to be have you there. You wanted to be here and uh, help us with the gender balance on the stage. Unfortunately, you were caught in a strike on the airport, so that's why you couldn't make it. So we are grateful for having you online here. Ulrike Franke, please go ahead for the European Council and uh, Foreign Relations in Paris. So first of all, I'll speak in English because I reckon that this way less people are going to need a translation. Um, really sorry I couldn't be there in person. I would have loved to. I was in Berlin yesterday and then had to leave very quickly because of the, the strike. But I'm really glad that we could do a remote um, contact uh, here anyway. So let me say two sentences on the European army on, or on the EU army. I find this quite difficult, especially here, you know, with the with the Greens, because I think at this point I have been... I have become known a little bit as the naysayer and, you know, miss no to European army. And the thing is, and I want to make this very clear, I've got nothing against kind of long-term visions and, you know, kind of really big ideas for Europe and the European Union going forward. On the contrary, I think this is what is needed. So this is me saying right now is perfect or there's no point in thinking long-term or anything like that. There is a kind of very specific way in which the European army, the EU army, can make sense. And that very specific way is if people are, are, are arguing for a United States of Europe. If someone comes up to me and say, hey, I want to build the United States of Europe, and then we're going to have an EU army, I'd say, great, go for it. I wouldn't necessarily kind of make this argument myself, but that is very coherent. The problem that I see is that these days, and honestly, you know, you know for the last... I want to say decades, but definitely for the last years, we keep having a discussion about European armies or a European army or an EU army without that first step as something that can be done relatively soon. Like people come up to me and say, hey, it makes no sense to have 27 armies or armed forces in the EU. Let's, let's kind of put them together. Wouldn't that be way more um, uh, efficient? And I do believe that that, that, that discussion is unhelpful, and in fact, kind of distracts from the discussions we should be having and things that we should be doing, really. I'll try to do this quite short, but give me, give me a few minutes just to explain to me why I'm saying this. When we talk about European armies or the EU army, I would say that broadly speaking, there are two options, right? So the first is people who say, we should bring the militaries of the 
EU27 together. So we dissolve the Bundeswehr, the French armed forces, etc., and we bring them together into one uh, EU army. And kind of 1B option would be don't take all 27, but take those of the countries that want to participate. So five or 10 or however many. That's option one. Keep that in mind. Option two is the 28th army. So we say we keep everything that we have, but we're going to create a kind of EU army armed forces for the EU or for Europe that we can then um, use. What's the problem with those both of these visions? So the first option, when you look at it at first glance, it sounds great in that you would gain massively in efficiency, right? I mean, right now we have 27 armed forces, 27 procurement methods, uh, very often 27 different types of machinery, equipment, you know, tanks and aircraft. There's this great list of how many different systems we have in Europe. You can look that up. And it looks ridiculous, right? Quite often it looks ridiculous. So we should do all of this together, shouldn't we? Yeah, sounds great. But the problem is, if we do this, we dissolve the Bundeswehr, we dissolve everything, we put we put together a, a European army. Who is going to decide who, uh, where, where, and when we should send these armed forces? Let's take a kind of scenario. Something is happening in, say, Africa, and I'm going to take the national stereotypes here. France and, I don't know, five other countries say we need to do something, we need to send the armed forces. But then, and I'm taking those at random, Portugal and Estonia and Germany says, we don't want to do this. What happens then? So who decides? If it's the governments, well, then we're blocked in this case. Is it the European Parliament or, say, any other EU institution? Well, then it may be possible to just have a majority vote, but that, in my view, is hugely problematic because sending the ability to send soldiers in harm's way, to be killed and to be harmed and to kill and to harm is kind of the, the, the highest level of national sovereignty. Are we willing to give that up to, say, the EU parliament? I would say, I would say no. So how do we do this? I, either majority decision. I think that that doesn't work and is super problematic. Or we say, well, OK, then Germany and Portugal and Estonia, again, I've taken those at random, are allowed to opt out. They don't have to go. The thing is, if you do that, you lose everything that you gain by having a kind of common EU army, because if you have a common EU army, it won't be possible anymore to say, you know, these are German tanks and German machine guns, and these are Estonian fighter jets, and these are the Portuguese soldiers. The whole point is that this would go together. If you can single them out, you would need the kind of duplication and 27-fold vacation um, that you wanted to avoid. So that doesn't, doesn't work either. So to be very clear, I'm not saying this kind of combined European army is just too difficult. You know, what language would they talk? Um, where would they be based? How do we decide who procures them and kind of who goes bankrupt uh, in, in the arms industry? All of those are good reasons why it may never happen, but that's not my point. My point is that I don't think this is desirable. I think that we would take kind of fundamental na national sovereign right, right, that I think needs to be at the national level, we would take this away. Um, and, and we would create something that, that just doesn't feel right before, again, before having a United States of Europe. That was option one. I'd, I'll be faster on option two because this is kind of the same problem. So option two was the 28th Army. This is something that has been put forward, especially by um, the Social Democrats in Germany, but also by others. So the idea is to say, hey, we keep the 27 EU member state armies and we create a kind of special force for the EU. Honestly, my immediate reaction to this is, where does the money come from? Because at this point, throughout Europe, and honestly, throughout the Western world, we do have problems funding our armed forces. And by the way, finding soldiers for our armed forces. So the idea that somehow very easily we can create a 28th army, I want to see the funding for that. I want to see the recruitment um, approach to that. I, don't, I think this is going to be really difficult. But if we can, the problem of the first option still remains. Who decides? Uh, where and when to send them. Do we do majority voting? Do we do unanimity and therefore block it forever? How do we do this? I don't see a, a way out here. And of course, side note, we already have the EU battle groups, a kind of European army, which, surprise, we've never used because we couldn't agree. Now, the EU battle groups have a whole host of other problems, so fair enough. But nevertheless, it kind of shows the, the problems um, of this. To finish, just because I don't want to be the person that says all of these ideas are stupid and there you go, that's not a great approach to take. I think there are things that can be done and that should be done. In fact, you know, we just had the question about how should European defense look like in the future. And I uh, gave my vote to 
European sovereignty or European strategic autonomy. Because I do believe that Europe needs to do much, 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 much worse, not just in light of the Trump presidency, also in light of the Trump presidency, but also because I find it relatively ridiculous that it's still the United States that are guaranteeing our security here at home, kind of the 350 million Americans are basically guaranteeing the, the, the security of 500 million um, Europeans. That makes no sense for me. So yes, we need to build up our capabilities. What should we be doing? Number one, and I'm sorry to say this at a kind of Green Foundation um, organization, but we do need to invest more in military capabilities, not just in Germany, but throughout Europe. It's being done to some extent, but you know this is really important and this needs to be done long term. But more importantly, on the European level, we need more common procurement, for example. And I don't mean just these kind of huge, very difficult, very complex projects like the future combat air system, FCAS, and, and the main battle tank, MGCS, and all of this, which are you know very long term and difficult, but also just procuring together to get economies of scale and to have the same systems in several different countries. We absolutely need to do that more. We need to consolidate our industry. I mean, you know, in the context of the war in Ukraine, we've seen that our industry isn't up to the task. We need more defense industry and we need to consolidate um, it better at the European uh, level. No question about this. And by the way, maybe we have time to talk about the role that Ukraine might be playing um, in the future in this, uh, in this endeavor, because the Ukrainian defense industry you know, by um, pressure, say, um, by, by Russia has really grown and become, you know, very good uh, over the last, the last two years. We do need more joint trainings. We do need more interoperability. So I want all of this. But my point is, we need to do this. We need to do this now. And having discussions about, you know, future European armies that either, as I'm more saying, don't make sense or are so long-term, are the thing that comes after the United States of Europe, aren't helpful. And in fact, in this in this time and age, I really worry that they distract from what we really should be talking about. And that's why, you know, I have this very strong view of the EU army and the European army not being the discussion of the day and what we should be talking about right now. Thank you, Ulrike. It's, I think, very clear that your message is. Thank you, Ulrike. I think your message has uh, been very clear, Sergei. Now I would like to um, take you into the discussion because Briefly summarizing what Ulrike said is basically it's a charming <coughs> idea to have a European army, but it and it also is quite fitting to the European, uh, sorry, to the green idea we want to be post national, etc. But apart from the small and many operative problems, there's the fundamental problem, if I understood Ulrike correctly, is that the EU member states do not want to delegate their sovereignty in this regard to Brussels. But at the same time, we've seen in the survey that most of these ideas, the idea of a European army, um, is well received. So I'm not asking a politician. What's your take on the vision of a European army? Is this a topic from your point of view? Do you say, well, at least I would like to continue to work on that as a long-term vision? Or do you say, I'm totally with Ulrike Franke and say, well, our daily issues are more important at the moment, so let's leave it to um, the newspaper uh, editorials or whatever. But I myself am currently in a different mode in when it comes to my work. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I think it's quite interesting that we spend so much time on it or are supposed to spend so much time on discussing such an aspect. Well, the vision of the European army is in my heart and also part of our uh, party uh, programs and it does not contradict what has been said. So in the medium and long term and also short term, we are faced with completely different problems. But if we look at the um, overall situation, we will see what Ulrike has already written in her um, article. In this increasingly multipolar world, this is a description of the situation and not what we desire. In this multipolar world, we can only assert ourselves if we pool resources, if we do not 
try to fight it alone as nation states, but only if we go it together as uh, the European Union. And this is what people here in this room, but also in the street out there, have to understand in the upcoming months. We, there will be AFD ideas or Sarah Wagenknecht's ideas, which will not allow us to make progress in the world that we're living in today. And at one point in this world, we will be faced with the need for a federal Europe, not in the upcoming 10 years, maybe not even in the upcoming 20 years, but um, basically, and the colleague says maybe yes, uh, here in the first row. And then the question is, what are we going to do in the field of security policy? And we cannot neglect that um, just because this vision is to a certain extent, ex distracting us from our daily business, we, m we shouldn't stop discussing it. So I think it is an option for the future, and we should be prepared for this option. And if we think from a federalist point of view, then we should also try to prepare ourselves for this option in the long run. But we should not forget that today and tomorrow, of course, we are faced with completely different concerns and priorities, which of course, eventually, in the long run, go into that direction. When it comes to Poland, when it comes to the harmonization of standards regarding ammunition, for example, when it comes to the many questions that uh, we are struggling with in Brussels today, um, <coughs> this is not um, the path towards more fragmentation, but the path towards more centralization. I think it's not contradicting each other. But still, I would say in these kind of discussion rounds, we should focus more strongly on the short term uh, important aspects like um, threat deterrence. Thank you very much. When it comes to the short term risks, it's always good to have Warsaw as um, part of the uh, discussion because this call that Ulrike has done, which is that Europe needs to invest more in its defense capabilities, is something that Warsaw, Warsaw hears quite uh, intensively. Uh, so a question to you, um, Lucas. Poland has, uh, has achieved, overachieved the 2% NATO goal and you are striving for 4%. I'm not sure whether you can afford it, but at least these are great ambitions. And I think you bought any tank at, on the European market that was out there, and you're starting to buy Korean tanks now. Um, and um, so you will have the biggest land forces in Europe and maybe be one of the most important security policy players in Europe. So from your point of view, when you hear the debate about a European army, European armed forces. Is this something that Warsaw is discussing at all? Or are you too much focused on daily politics and say, OK, we will buy tanks wherever we can find them, first of all, and we leave the debate to others who are a little bit more relaxed and lagging behind, maybe? Well, uh, first and foremost, many thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, speaking uh, as uh, a Polish analyst, but of course not a representative of uh, a Polish uh, government, uh, I, I side here very much with uh, Ulrike's uh, approach that uh, it's good to have a vision if you are a politician, uh, if you perhaps uh, want to put uh, something in the political program. Uh, but we also have uh, to focus on the situation which is uh, very challenging very difficult. Uh, Poland uh, put 4.2% of GDP on defense this year, not because we have ambitions or because we like uh, to invest uh, in armed forces at the expense uh, of other priorities, but because we see uh, the security environment in our parts of Europe deteriorating rapidly. Uh, we see our immediate neighbor uh, being uh, attacked uh, very viciously, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we don't see uh, the perspective for this situation uh, to be uh, improved. Unfortunately, neither through diplomacy, uh, peace initiatives, uh, we are where we are with uh, Russia, uh, and unfortunately, uh, the name of the game for the next uh, a couple of years uh, or, or decade uh, is uh, deterrence, uh, containment of Russia, uh, and if deterrence fails, uh, the uh, preparation uh, to defend us 
and defend us uh, Europeans uh, in a way that would be uh, successful. Uh, therefore, uh, I'm very much for focusing on uh, this uh, short-term uh, perspective. And even at the European Union, uh, Ulrike, uh, I think, mentioned it briefly, it's not that we don't have a plan. It's not that we don't know what to do. Actually, uh, the meetings of the EU defense ministers uh, and EU uh, defense agency are getting increasingly, uh, increasingly congested with uh, specific things to do. Uh, support to Ukraine, uh, joint uh, armament uh, procurement, uh, work uh, on uh, implementing uh, the, EU, uh, the EU strategic compass. I don't know, maybe people forgot, but we actually, we adopted at the European Union a blueprint for developing uh, our security and defense policy. Uh, important work on uh, strengthening our uh, industrial, uh, defense industrial um, base. When we all agree that it should be done and it should be more effective, but you, know, you go into details and there are some interesting and challenging questions. If you for example, move from 10 times, 10, 10 different types of a particular weapon to only two, what would happen to the producers uh, of, the, of the eight? Uh, would they have to be absorbed uh, under the, the big uh, uh, companies or, or not? So specific questions here, but the direction, I think direction is, uh, is, is clear. Uh, so uh, we didn't really discuss NATO. Uh, NATO did not disappear. NATO is quite actually uh, strengthened uh, also in its uh, resolve in terms of deterrence and defense uh, and, and cooperation. Uh, so uh, we have uh, actually our agenda already uh, cut for us. And there is a question for me, uh, to what extent discussing the long-term vision uh, would deflect our attention uh, from the very specific uh, tasks that we already adopted ourselves. Vielen Dank, Lukas. Wir haben jetzt dieses Thema Verteidigungsausgaben angeschnitten. Thank you, Lukas. Uh, we have discussed the uh, military spendings already and uh, I want to come up with a quote from Joska Fischer, which I read in the newspaper, saying we have to arm um, more and more. I didn't think that 75, I would say this, but the world has changed. And from if you hear this sentence, is uh, an impression of urgency and Amal Lerman has mentioned this. She says this sense of urgency that Europe is threatened in some kind of way as it hasn't been in the decades past. Is this this um, impression everywhere? And uh, my question goes to European, to Ulrike uh, Franke, European Council Council of Foreign Relations. You assist the discourse in different areas, different cities, Paris, London. You have a general background on the security discussion in Europe. What is your feeling um, uh, concerning this appeal of urgency that Joska Fischer mentioned, is that and how's that picked up in Paris, Madrid, and Rome? Um, two very quick uh, reactions to what was just what has just been said. Um, one of the reasons why I think it is worth having the discussion on whether it's worth having the discussion on say the European uh, Army is that. I think there is a danger that because right now there is an urgency to do more, people are looking for silver bullets, right? And so we kind of try to find the one answer that's going to uh, solve our problems. The European Army is one. Conscription and military service in Germany, I think, is a, is a similar one. And indeed, this question about kind of Europe's nuclear deterrent. So there's always this kind of hope that can we find the one answer, the one thing we can do and therefore solve our, all our problems. And unfortunately, it's not it's not so easy, um, but it does come come up all the time, which is why I keep kind of talking about it. That's the first thing. And the second thing on, on, on what Lucas said. So I think the point about the European Union is, and I should have said this in my initial remarks, the European Union is doing a lot. And honestly, as someone who has been watching kind of European defense, EU defense for a long time, it is truly impressive what the EU has been doing not just since the, the kind of 24th of February 2022, but even before with all those efforts, you know, PESCO and EDF, with the whole um, the whole acronym soup. Honestly, I, I do believe that we are doing 
an, an unbelievable amount. The question is just, is it enough? Because saying we're doing, we're doing a lot, we're doing so much more than we used to, if it's not enough, it's worth very little. And there's a fear that it's not enough, but you know, there we go. Um, and NATO, just one final sentence on that, the NATO framework concept, which we don't talk about it about so much, actually is maybe what comes closest to efforts to build a European army, because the NATO framework concept is this idea of kind of having, well, framework nations, such as Germany, where other smaller nations can kind of plug into their um, their military capabilities. And so that that kind of brings us to this more, more coherent European um, capability within NATO. On the urgency, at the extent to which it has been... Um, it has been understood everywhere. I go back and forth on this, by the way, especially in Germany. So Germany, I find really interesting. And I feel that right now, from what I can see from, you know, my visits to Berlin, the feeling among within the kind of national security circles is one of frustration and tiredness in the sense that it feels like on the 24th of February, and by the way, on the 27th, when Olaf Scholz held his famous famous Zeitenwende speech, we, or I, really got the impression that, yes, something has changed. There is a sense of urgency. We have now understood, after several years where we already should have understood this, that this idea of this kind of peaceful normal that we enjoyed for the last 30 years, that I and my generation grew up in, I have never known anything else, may not be the normal forever, may not, may not be normal at all, and just times have changed and we need to change things. And I really got the, this impression at the beginning of the, the Russian invasion. But somehow, this has faded out. I mean, things are being done, but kind of slowly, and the urgency seems to be, seems to be lacking. And this is something I kind of see in, in a few other countries as well. It's different in different European countries. You, of course, have, say, more towards the East. The countries that didn't exactly need Russia's invasion to feel a sense of urgency. So the Baltics... Poland to some extent, you know, they kind of were aware of the threat and the risk, but now, of course, have have scaled up their um, their work um, on defense and security quite a bit. Poland, we just talked about four percent of GDP. Um, you know, whether or not they can afford it is 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 another question. But but anyway, there's a lot being done and more being done than before. Um, we do have, of course, Sweden and Finland that change their their posture quite dramatically uh, because of this sense of urgency. We do have in the bigger countries, so France and, and Great Britain, um, a, a feeling of urgency, but similarly, as in Germany, a bit of a, um, it's not so easy to, to change things dramatically, uh, especially because, you know, here we're talking a large amount of funding in countries that, of course, need funding for many other things. So here it also goes a bit more sluggish than um, than maybe people would have wanted. So yeah, to put this kind of in, in one sentence, I do believe that politically, and by the way, in most societies, there is a, a realization that things have changed and may not go back to this normal. However, this sentiment needs to be guided politically to kind of actually lead to something. And in most countries or in many countries, and especially again in my country, Germany, things have just slowed down too much and the urgency has not translated sufficiently into action. And that, I think, is really dangerous. Thank you, Ulrike. I would like to ask uh, Sergei whether you can share this view as someone who lives in Brussels and who um, not, uh, no offense, uh, inside the Brussels bubble. Um, so... Has that uh, turn of times, Zeitenwende, caused some upstir and things have come back to the comfy business as usual? In Brussels, at least in the circles that you talk to, maybe the European Greens, is this sense of urgency that we need to do more in f defense politics or has that evaporated as well? And we are a bit of where we are in France and Germany. I don't think it has evaporated in Germany, but the competencies in Brussels are simply uh, different and not there. There's no competency to address this. Uh, <clears throat> of course, competency in terms of capability, yes, but not uh, being involved. 
because Brussels doesn't have only people from Germany or Western Europe, but in Eastern Europe and uh, Central Europe as well, we always had this sense of urgency. And I recall also from the past when we were on, uh, at Nord Stream 2, we, the politicians in Brussels, had advanced much more than maybe some of the colleagues who were in Berlin. Also, because... We are in constant exchange with everybody on international levels. And the question that Ulrike raised, of course, is we have to appreciate that as a German uh, society and the European Union, we have changed much since the Russian attack on Ukraine. Lots of things have been done. The acronyms that are being used, be as SAP, be as uh, Defense Fund and many others. Ukraine facility is being negotiated at the moment. The question is of what is good for civil services and whatnot. And many of these questions wouldn't have been imaginable before, but we are now in a world which is messy, where developments are much faster than uh, two things. First, our mental adjustment. I think the mental adjustment also with us in Germany, in the party, I have to say, maybe the Greens are a bit more advanced than many others. If I look at some of the surveys and the polls that the Green uh, people, how they put themselves, how they position themselves, I think it's interesting. There is much more of a sense for urgency of change. We can have a different panel on this, possibly, why this may be the case. Also, possibly uh, because of the Green postulate that, in general, we are have to be much more open for transformation and really have to face the reality of change outside, be it in climate or in the security politics. Um, but if I go beyond this, if... I look at the Eastern Europe and talk to people there. There's very, very different uh, assessments to this, and that stops our political discussion to a certain extent, especially prior to elections. We feel this. We note this. And, uh, of course, there's a counter-reaction to this as well, like a uh, bully um, defense politics like the FTP is saying who uh, talk, uh, who want to be the generals of Brussels now, and everything only should be focused on a very unilateral defense strategy and safety vision, uh, I think that we have to be able to do both. We have to appreciate that, or acknowledge rather, uh, that safety is has become much more complex because the world has become more complex. And this is why we have to talk about that. It's not only conventional arms, but also not only the other. And, well, the other, which the, the name which we don't want to mention here, well, <laughs> we're going to come to that. Anyway, anyway, uh, uh, so not only arms as such, but also hybrid risks, information war, because I dare a prediction if we only have five years, some may say two, until we may be confronted uh, with a risk on behalf of the or a threat on the Russian Federation by the Russian Federation, that attack or whatever that may be is not just going to be conventional. It's going to be hybrid. It's going to be hybrid provocation, first of all, saying which uh, well, may start in Navra, Estland. Well, not forecasting this, but we've got enough pockets on the borders to the Russian Federation or its area of influence where a conflict could be tweaked without really uh, getting into an open conflict. And that is the capability of defense that we have to prepare for. And I won't even start with digital questions. We've had the, the AI law, which we thought through here in uh, Berlin, the AI Act. And 
The point is that this act, uh, AI in the military uh, is not addressed because we don't have competency to that. And uh, the member states didn't want that. But this is an area that we have to look into. Surely we see that in the Gaza war now that this digital dimension has long become a reality which we in some areas and certain circles discuss but not in a broad general public discussion. So in brief, we do not do enough mentally as well as strategically. I do not see any lead leadership in Berlin, neither in Berlin in this area, to move this change and transformation forward. You don't get this done by put, simply putting money in. You have to have a clear uh, approach, clear prioritization, and this can't be done by a defense minister, uh, but that has to be done by the top of the government. And this is something that I have been demanding for since the time, turns of times that Zeit and Wende this is not mobilizing the society in this direction. This is missing, and this is what we need. Before I open the discussion for the audience, I would like to start with one big issue, which uh, I also ask about in the online uh, questionnaire, in the online survey, which is the issue of nuclear. Uh, questions. Does the EU need an independent nuclear deterrent? So why did I ask this question? Because Joskar Fischer, whose interview I read, said the EU needs an independent own nuclear deterrence. Why is he saying this? And now I'm coming to you, Lucas. He says this because seemingly <coughs> there are doubts in the existence of the American nuclear umbrella under which Poland and all the other NATO countries are or have been for decades. So recently, your institute, Lucas, has um, published a study where you said the American nuclear umbrella needs to be modernized. It needs to, well, it might not be that credible anymore. And before we start with the debate whether the EU has to do something, my question is, how about our NATO, our American a nuclear umbrella? Is it still credible? Is it still working? And how about the upcoming years? Uh, if you don't mind, I'll also then later address the issue of the euro bomb uh, phrase. <laughs> uh, phrase. Um, but uh, a, a short comment uh, on, on the discussions here in Germany, which, of course, I'm, I'm not a German speaker, so I'm getting glimpses of this debate. And I'm always puzzled why it comes back to the things that I think were already established quite firmly uh, on the, with regards to the German direction on foreign and defense uh, policy. So why the questions about urgency, again, uh, were things uh, have not, unfortunately, changed massively for 2022. Uh, the uh, Russian war with Ukraine is still going uh, on. Uh, we actually have uh, a, a new uh, centers uh, of uh, fire uh, in other parts uh, of our immediate uh, neighborhood. Uh, we have the uh, hybrid slash gray zone uh, operations uh, threat. Uh, that we have we have already seen uh, the Russians, the Belarusian regime, but also some others, including the Chinese, uh, using part of this playbook when it comes to uh, disinformation, when it comes to uh, trying to influence uh, the way that our democracies uh, work. Uh, so it's it's not that things got better and we can uh, reassess our priorities, but actually uh, we we are where we. Uh, where we are, uh, and the question of urgency, uh, I think if you uh, put uh, the argument uh, to uh, your citizens, um, they uh, could make an informed uh, decision uh, about it. Um, whether Seid and Wende is too slow, yes, yes. At the level of implementation, uh, it seems that uh, some things, including uh, the work uh, and the modernization uh, of the German armed forces, could have been going with a, a greater speed, with greater uh, uh, urgency. 
Um, but uh, at least the plan is there. So it's more for me the issue of implementation. Uh, on the nuclear, on the nuclear uh, uh, question, uh, well, currently the situation is that, that uh, within the NATO framework, uh, we have three centers of nuclear decision making. We have the US, but we also have uh, the uh, French uh, and the British uh, potential and uh, their nuclear arsenal. Of course, the Americans, in a sense, overshadow everything because uh, of uh, the, 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 the size of their arsenal, because of their political uh, uh, significance, uh, also because they are in the centers uh, of this very specific nuclear sharing uh, arrangement in which uh, nuclear weapons are stationed in a territory of a number of states uh, and their fighters uh, are prepared also to participate in the, in the nuclear mission. Uh, and for me, uh, one of the questions here uh, is how do we make this arrangement that already exists uh, more credible and adapted to the current situation? Uh, and again, this is not uh, ad adopting the systems just for uh, the sake of adopting it. Uh, we've seen the Russians modernizing uh, their nuclear capabilities. Uh, we see the Russian leadership making a number of very disturbing uh, nuclear uh, threats. Uh, we saw the announcement about deployment of uh, Russian nuclear weapon uh, to Belarus. Uh, so we should be prepared that the Russians could use the nuclear card and again and again. And I'm not saying here about nuclear attack against any particular city, but I'm talking about the use of nuclear weapons for coercion uh, purposes. So that's part of the answer, uh, how to make, uh, how do we adopt uh, the nuclear uh, posture at NATO uh, to the new uh, circumstances. Uh, there is the second part of, of the issue, uh, the question what happens uh, if uh, the Americans completely, completely dismantle uh, their security commitment to Europe. And I considered this option very unlikely. Let's not treat the uh, victory of Mr. Trump in the election as something uh, inevitable or actually very likely. So there is a first question, no, do we, would, aren't we assuming too much about the results of the uh, US election? Then there is a second question, even if uh, Mr. Trump gets uh, elected, uh, what would be the actual changes uh, in the US uh, policy to Europe? We know that there would be changes, but how far and how severe would they go, including in the nuclear domain? Uh, that's still an open uh, question. Uh, for me. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, French have offered uh, a dialogue uh, on, uh, the, uh, on their nuclear uh, arsenal, uh, and uh, the French president uh, talks uh, that uh, the French nuclear deterrent has a European uh, dimension. So if we have really this worst case scenario, I think you would need to come back uh, to this discussion and maybe relaunch this kind of strategic uh, dialogue uh, with France, maybe also with the UK, also enlarge it. But let's not go too early uh, or too recklessly uh, in that direction. Uh, the EU nuclear deterrent, uh, let's not forget that we have three countries inside the European Union that actually signed and ratified the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We have Austria, we have uh, Ireland, and we have uh, Malta. And these countries, under international law, under the obligations that they uh, took on themselves, uh, they would not, uh, they could not station nuclear weapons on, on uh, their soil, they could not, they don't want to be covered by nuclear uh, deterrence uh, guarantees. So, you know, try to go through this first hurdle, this first obstacle, uh, if we are discussing the EU, the, the, the EU approach as such. The fact that in the EU you have one country that is possessing nuclear weapons and three countries that are under uh, legal obligation uh, to get rid of nuclear weapons and never had them again, and also distance themselves from nuclear, uh, from nuclear uh, deterrence. Thank you very much, Serge. I saw that you wanted to say something, but I would like to take uh, Ulrike into the discussion because Macron was mentioned. And Lucas, what you said is 
quite a moderate but optimistic view that things might stay the way they are. So the American nuclear umbrella is here to stay, even though if Trump might win, the last decision has not been taken yet. But still, there there is this debate going around, what if, and there is this offer of France to say, well, we could imagine to be the nuclear protective power of the European Union. Ulrike, question to you. Is this a credible security promise of France? Can we relax now and say, okay, this is going to be a good thing? Or should we rather send a few um, strict questions to Berlin? I would put it this way. There is no French promise yet, uh, so to speak. What has happened is that Macron kind of said that we can have a dialogue on the question. And I found it rather vague. And I think this was by design because I'm not sure or I don't think he has a very specific kind of proposal. So it is true that the Germans basically didn't answer that that call, that, you know, putting it out there. Um, but then it wasn't also very clear from the, uh, from the French side. Um, contrary to the European army, I think this is a discussion definitely worth having. Now, I do agree largely with Lucas that the nuclear deterrent element of NATO and the kind of U.S. nuclear umbrella under NATO isn't kind of my very first um, kind of point of concern under a Trump presidency. Um, I think Trump would seriously weaken NATO and its conventional deterrence. And I think there's a there's a danger that this could lead to kind of probing and prodding by, say, Russia and other actors into NATO. I don't think that it would certainly not automatically or necessarily kind of create the kind of attack where the nuclear deterrent becomes really relevant. But it is it is it is dangerous. And so I think it is worth thinking about a kind of European option. However, here again, we've had a bunch of proposals being floated that to me make no sense. A kind of, you know, European nuclear football that somehow rotates around the, the, the European capitals. I mean, that's the opposite of a convincing deterrent factor. I'm sorry to say, like, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Also, I don't believe in a kind of euro bomb. I mean, thanks a lot, thanks a lot to Lucas for mentioning the kind of neutral uh, countries in the EU, and those, which are the same that, that are um, uh, saying no to, to, to the nuclear uh, deterrent element. So definitely within the EU, that is that is basically impossible, I'd say, but it could be a kind of European um, thing. But given that, you know, not only do we have the countries that basically say we need to ban nuclear weapons, we have everybody else who signed the non-proliferation treaty, which means that, you know, UK and France, they can't kind of give up nuclear weapons to Germany or, or Poland or whoever they want to, that would be in breach of, of international law they, they signed too. So I think that kind of euro bomb doesn't make that much sense. But nuclear sharing at a kind of European level as an addition, maybe long-term alternative to the US nuclear umbrella, I think that debate is worth having. Let's put it this way. I don't know where we would end up. I'm also not the main expert on kind of nuclear capabilities, so I don't want to kind of make a final uh, point on this on this right now. But I think that is something worth having because, yes, the whole the NATO deterrence, the nuclear um, umbrella of, of uh, the US has been providing us with is slowly being put in question. Again, not the main thing I worry about late at night, but at least long term and also just not just under our Trump presidency, but just under, you know, successive presidencies of presidents that aren't as intuitively and as automatically European as Joe Biden is. Um, I think that discussion is worth having. And so let's let's call the French and ask them, you know, what exactly did you mean and what can we talk about? And is nuclear sharing on the European continent something that makes sense strategically and, and could be done? I think that's that I, I'd, I'd like to have that discussion. Ulrike, uh, Sergei, ich hab Thank you very much, Ulrike. Sergei. I did not invite you into the third part of the debate, but if you like, please go ahead. I know that you're not very into this nuclear issue, though I promise it to myself and the world that I will refrain from these kind of discussions. Um, but, uh, but I just wanted to briefly come back to the deterrence. And what you 
said that NATO will work and also under Trump and that this promise might be upheld. But much comes down to how it is perceived on the other side of the Atlantic. And I think the mere fact that it is unclear that this promise will be upheld is to a certain extent already a weakening of the deterrence effect. And this might happen like that. I mean, President Trump, should he be elected a second time? I mean, we do not want to uh, say that he will, but um, he will surely not say, OK, I will take back this promise, this guarantee, but he will always be like an insecure combatant, so to speak, on the Western side. People will not be sure about what he's going to do. And this element of insecurity will be perceived by the other side. And um, this means that we see a weakening. And the deterrence game, of course, only, I mean, it works slightly differently. There will also be the question, and many people assume that deterrence currently is um, a safeguard against a conventional aggression, conventional attack. But the question is, is this still true? So how does the other side perceive it? For example, in the course of a conventional threat, would the other side be um, prepared to come to the respective assessment? So it's all very complicated. But I'm sure that if Trump does not say anything about it, we will be rid of the problem. So this is not going to happen. I think the whole situation is very complex. And um, with our ideals and values, uh, once again, we are in a very complex world and are faced with a dilemma because we are not the ones who are happy to have these kind of discussions. This is actually not what we stand for, but the world is very mm. complex. A short reaction from Lucas, and then I have a final question for the three of you. I think that we are in a very intense agreement uh, with, with each other uh, because, uh, of course, uh, here the uh, trends in the U.S. Uh, grand strategy, but also internal politics, uh, is that uh, of in decreased importance of, of Europe. Uh, and that is regardless of the results of the elections. Even the Americans uh, who are uh, friendly uh, towards the transatlantic relations are more or less kindly warning us that this is the time that we should take more responsibility on uh, ourselves. So uh, we are discussing uh, European strategic uh, sovereignty, strengthening of European uh, defense and resilience, uh, partly uh, because we also want to be ahead uh, of the developments inside uh, the uh, United uh, States. Uh, on European nuclear sharing, the, the slight problem is that uh, what I hear from a number of experts in Paris is that they don't believe in nuclear sharing the way that is done by the Americans and others in NATO. They don't buy it. That's an interesting moment that the French, who are very much open to Europeanizing almost everything, they get very territorial when it comes to their own nuclear weapons in terms of the uh, decision making, uh, in terms of capabilities. This is one of the areas that they say, thank you very much, but we prefer to rely on uh, ourselves and we are not sharing uh, the uh, mythical red button. Last question to the panelists and also in Paris here. So for one hour we've been on the stage now and we talked about armament, about nuclear deterrence, about defense spending. However, we are a green foundation. So the question is, what happens with the values that I've mentioned at the beginning? Disarmament, trust-building measures, cooperative security policy. And that's what I would like to talk uh, about with you now. Just a brief statement from all of you. Maybe it can start with you, Lucas, and also a biographic note. So we met for the first time 18 years ago, two young researchers, peace researchers, you 
were also involved in strategic studies at the time, and both of us were in the field of arms control, nuclear disarmament, trust building measures. That's what we focused on, um, also with Russia. And we met um, in Brussels several times in order to focus on this issue of cooperative um, approach and disarmament. So what happened to us? What happened to us? And the question now is, and this is a question also to the other colleagues, the whole topic of cooperative security, let's face it, I mean, it's uh, trust building measures, uh, arms control. Has this been taken off the table? Can we only deter Russia and increase our defense spending? Or is there still an area where we have started, Lucas, uh, where we were still idealistic that we can continue? So is there a political space for um, the things that have moved us 18 years ago? One of uh, the very first uh, research papers uh, which I did was entitled It's Time to Withdraw Nuclear Weapons, U.S. Nuclear Weapons for Europe, uh, because they are not necessary uh, for maintaining security. Uh, I would not write it the same thing right now, but at that time, uh, 20 years ago, uh, that seemed uh, like this is the direction where we would be uh, going. Uh, I like to think that you know you you can stay idealistic, but you can't be naive. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, this is something that the Russian propaganda often uh, basically paints in a uh, in a completely false uh, uh, false light. This idea that we didn't want to talk to the Russians, that we didn't want to engage. Uh, the Russians. Uh, we spent uh, some time trying to engage Russia on confidence building, uh, on uh, arms control uh, measures, of trying to work out uh, the principle uh, of sustainable coexistence uh, in Europe, also in the, in the security uh, sphere. Uh, but when you see uh, these efforts uh, being actually not only rejected, but also uh, exploited by the Russians uh, in order to, to weaken uh, NATO, to weaken EU's uh, resolve, uh, and also to conduct uh, their very aggressive policy in their immediate neighborhood, then, of course, you know, maintaining the same approach, uh, for me, going from idealistic to being naive. Uh, so unfortunately, I wish we discussed uh, arms control uh, with, with Russia, but we are in a situation that we are discussing the strengthening of uh, deterrence. And if we do it right, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, have to, uh, we wouldn't have to wage war uh, with, with Russia. So the overall uh, goal here is still, I guess, the goal of maintaining uh, peace here and restoring just peace in Ukraine. Vielen Dank, Lukas. Uh, Ulrike, du bist mir bis jetzt, jetzt nicht Thank you, Lukas. Uh, Ulrike, you haven't been sticking out as an arms control and peace researcher so far. I would like to hear your podcast, but um, the question, however, is do you see in the current situation in the politi political space for cooperative safety policy in trust-building measures, uh, arms controls towards Russia and other let me call them difficult partners, because at the moment um, our discussion in the green area is uh, um, dominated by these topics. I once offered a job on working on disarmament, and I said that there are so many people thinking about disarmament, and I tend to be more one of those people that say, well, maybe there are pockets where we should be arming rather than disarming. Um, but jokes aside, and of course, you know, working on, on armament these days does have a peace element. So I, I don't want to kind of create a juxta juxtaposition between uh, creating capable armed forces and, and peace on the contrary. But a few points. So first of all, yes, we aren't in a kind of era of disarmament. That is the unfortunate truth. At the same time, you know, you don't disarm among friends, right? The whole point is that you do arms control and disarmament contracts among, well, opponents, um, although, 
kind of enemies that are currently fighting wars is not is not um ideal ideal or supporting um actors who are fighting uh wars i think the main thing we can hope for or should strive for um at the moment isn't so much disarmament efforts between russia and the united states or something but we should be focusing on making sure that we don't get nuclear proliferation i think that's a danger area at the moment because because of this whole war um we do see or countries around the world see the the value of having nuclear weapons and the disadvantages of not having them or having given them up which is kind of the narrative of ukraine which is not quite right but anyway um so so i i think what we need to work on right now is not to have more uh, nuclear proliferation or have nuclear proliferation there is one specific area, and that's where I primarily work on these days, where I do have some hope that we can at least have discussions about arms control, not disarmament, but arms control. And that is the area of new technologies and specifically autonomy in warfare and artificial intelligence in warfare. Now, this is really difficult because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's different in terms of technology than previous technologies or systems we did arms control and disarmament on. But right now we do have discussions on maybe finding some kind of agreements and norms on when and when not to use autonomous weapon systems, AI in warfare. And I think these discussions are worth having. And I think these we can definitely have right now, even among all the countries that, you know, don't like each other a lot at the moment, because there is a common goal of making sure that we don't uh, run into catastrophic situations, you know, so-called flash wars and um, arms races. And anyway, I don't, I don't want to go into detail right now, but um, I think there, there can be a kind of common level of agreement of saying, no matter how we stand to each other, there are certain things we absolutely want to avoid. And therefore we can come up with some kind of rules and, and norms on what to do and what not to do when it comes to autonomy. So that's kind of most positive spin I can give to this. But yeah, it's not it's not exactly the 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 era, let's say, of of arms control and and disarmament. And so, um, the, the the bar for what we can hope for, I think, is is rather low. But making sure that we don't get nuclear proliferation, I think that's already a very worthy goal. Thank you for that approach. And Sergei, the last word would go to you. Um, after the discussion on defense uh, efforts and so on, is there political space for traditional green disarmament based um, relaxation politics um, towards Russia? That's the focus of our defense uh, as it is. And so is there any way or do we have to say we simply need to spend more money on arms and hope for the best? Well, I think every historic era has its discussions and focus areas and the green values and the principles, green concepts are not only covering engagement of the other side. There's much more green uh, aspects to the security and defense politics, and we should talk about that. And I think that we have to make clear that we are convinced Greens, but we are not helpful idiots for despots and aggressors. And this is something that we have to word and as we are green, as we work with minorities, with women, with uh, minorities in many of these countries and also in occupied areas and we happen having good contacts, we know what this is all about. Maybe better than some other parties who do not have this focus. And this is why I do see that this is nothing ungreen in saying that we stand up to maintain peace, to maintain humanity, to maintain human rights. And in this, we have to speak about how can we defend and draw red lines for aggressors including military means or preparation for that. But this doesn't mean that we 
should uh, forget about other topics that are important for us. If we talk about security, that we have to talk about a holistic security approach that by now already we prepare and try to avoid uh, disasters and crises that uh, may be lurking around and which others are happy to forget and just concentrate on that one conflict without looking two steps ahead. And obviously, and I still stand up for this, that of course we have a feministic falling foreign policy and defend it in this area as well. Even if people smile at us, if people have no idea of what this is all about in these situations. So I think we can be very self-confident in our green security and safety politics. And uh, there's no reason at all to beg pardon from everyone uh, because we uh, <clears throat> face this new security reality. Also, in the interest of many people who live now and the future generation, generations to come. Thank you. We have 20 minutes to go, and if you have questions, you're welcome to forward them. I see some hands are rising. Ask in German or English as you like. We'll start with the gentleman on the fourth row, and then the lady in the second row, and here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a historics, historian, politics, and head of the East European Center in uh, Berlin. And my question goes to Segal. I think the question, the time change has uh, maybe slowed down a bit more much. But without a German turn of times, the European turn of times won't move forward. That's why Germany is too important. There was a lot of discussion on the political level, but another one stakeholder was show to short this civil society. This society, civil society can and has to be politically active. And my question is now, what can the German civil society uh, do in order to move the turn of times forward in Germany and in Europe and speed it up? Thank you. An excellent question. You have mentioned uh, the person to answer and uh, put a question. That is rare nowadays, So, and I hope the lady in the second row, row will do the same. Uh, let's see. Well, I am a bit older, and I can recall that the people in Berlin were afraid that the Russians would invade. And uh, now that we are back in this kind of situation now, of course, is disastrous. But I am missing complexity in the discussion here um, that there are other green topics like the important uh, climate catastrophe which is coming in. It has been mentioned, I think, is very good. But one short thing. You have uh, recalled how you two started um, in peace research. And this is even the consideration then whether in Germany we would need nuclear weapons. And they're still there. They're still there. They are here, the American weapons. And when Mr. Mützenich uh, um, had uh, a part of the coalition started in 2001. Do we still need these atomic weapons? There was a massive thunderstorm, and immediately the US woke up and made everything possible. Now to question North Stream and so on. So you see that I'm going down a different line, and I do not have a question. But for me, it would be very important to make a, a look at a bit uh, out of the box and see the complexity of things and not just think, when is the rush going to come? Maybe there are other details and other things that should be taken into the discussion in order to be able to assess the overall situation in a sensible way. Thank you for listening to me. You can pass the microphone on to the gentleman next to you and then the gentleman 
in this room, and then we'll start to answer. I'm sorry, I'll stay seated. I'm two meters high tall, but I'd like to take up your idea, Mr. Shodacini, and involve two people from the panel for my question, the colleague from Poland and um, uh, Ms. Franke from Paris. Um, and you'll know what I'm going at, 1991, uh, 30 years ago, I know what happened, um, the Weimar Triangle, which many people won't remember, um, especially the younger people, maybe I'm a bit older, so that was a great format, and uh, somehow that disappeared. Uh, Poland is one of the most important partners in the military NATO uh, alliance. Uh, France uh, has the... Uh, nuclear uh, umbrella in Germany is the economic power. So what does the panel think whether this uh, Weimar Triangle, however you'd like to call it, uh, that very good and strong partnership internationally, how helpful could that be? Well, one more question, and then I think we'll proceed to answer the questions. Wolfgang Templin. Uh, Publisher, one uh, meter seventy-six high only at all. So uh, I'm very happy, Sergey, that uh, we think so closely. Uh, you're my old colleague. I have just uh, published uh, something for the Deutschland Archiv. I'm happy to provide it here for the website because it addresses all these topics. The working title is uh, Dying for Narva. That goes back to... Uh, 1939, where there were certain uh, pri pre forms of hybrid war provoked, uh, um, which was the quarrel on Danzig. They didn't want to start the Second World War. They just wanted to take a step forward in Danzig uh, and Gdansk. And uh, so uh, that was the question. Uh, hopefully not dying for Gdansk and. Uh, we know what came out of this. So I want to show with this um, how strong the historic parallel may be. But we have this situation, and we have the possible attempt of Russia not just to have a classical traditional intervention, but the Russian um, population ask for protection, and then things take their course. And then the question is, how do the stakeholders react? And the second is on the 22nd of uh, uh, January, the day of Ukraine, who was there? It was Donald Tusk, and he ask for a consequence which we still don't have in Germany. So I'm very happy to have this contribution here and the presence in the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Templin. It's very good. We could discuss this for an hour. I'd just like to um, take up one point for you, Sergei, which came from the first uh, question whether this turn of times, Titan Vendor, which is a bit of dragging on in Germany, should be picked up by the civil society and uh, move, be moved forward. Yes, and in a certain... We are here looking at an example. We are here hosts and visiting one of the stakeholders in the civil society. So as a politician, politician um, although it's not a term I'm happy with, I would like to tell the civil society what it should do. I think that's not part of politics to do that. Our task is to protect civil society, and that is what I am working with. And how can we manage to get this society not to be um, exculpated and uh, how to uh, how things are moved, how not to harass people? And I'm saying this because of the mental change of attitudes with all of us that we've been talking about, which without, without which a Zeitman is not possible to think, and here uh, you haven't given us your name, but uh, um, not even with your size, but uh, uh, just what you have said is, I've heard this, I have traveled 
the state of Brandenburg, where we had exchange on this. And um, I, I think it's very uh, important to look at these different perspectives and our view on the world. I think this is something where civil society can play a very valuable role. And there is little voicing given to people concerned. That's what I note. That's uh, often we don't reach people on the argumentation level. Uh, but, for example, if I have uh, Ukrainian survivors of the massacre or their families, uh, people who have uh, who are refugees, uh, Russian dissidents who uh, are, are going through a lot in Russia because they are against the war, that makes things more tangible here. And so that would be a recommendation for the civil society, more the more work with these personal stories so that we can find a common level and not just exchange arguments, but really try to understand what it means for the people and how should we or shouldn't we react. So that would be a recommendation, uh, a modest recommendation from politics. Apart from that, we support you wherever we can, whatever may happen. Thank you very much. Uh, the question of Wolfgang Templin is the one I would like to pick up now because I really liked it and ask it to you, Ulrike, and you, Lucas, and in a generalized way. So Ulrike, he asks the question, dying for Gdansk, dying for Narva. This is a question that we might have to ask ourselves many times over the next years for the reasons that we've already discussed. That, for example, France has to give security guarantees for countries that are far away from Paris. And there is also the big question of credibility, which is then at the heart of the discussion. So it's a topic that was very present during the Cold War. At the time, the security guarantees came from the US, and these security guarantees were uh, credible. So we believed in these security guarantees and also our opponents. But now the big question is, which I would like to ask you and also you, Lucas, if this question is asked to Paris, would your country or the country that you're in, Ulrike, uh, put the survival at risk for Narva or Gdansk as the Americans did in the Cold War? Because if they do not, we would have a problem. So for, by the way, I'm sticking to English because I was told that it's better if I stick to one language. So it's interesting that you ask this because I actually noted earlier, I think when Lucas was speaking, that even throughout the Cold War and, and throughout NATO's existence, there was always a bit of a question mark behind that question of would the U.S. exchange Washington for Berlin or Philadelphia for Hamburg? So the question of, you know, when push comes to shove, is the U.S. really... Um, uh, ready to kind of give that nuclear deterrence if it means um, um, being hurt themselves. And of course, yes, we, we, we did believe that to a certain extent, and that's why this works. But I think it is worth noting that there's always this ambiguity when it comes to deterrence, that you aren't quite sure. And this is why, you know, statements and Donald Trump and all of that is so important, because you can never be quite sure. Um, what is the situation right now? I mean, I guess today, the question marks behind French, but I don't think we need to single out the French right now because there is no kind of French shared European deterrent, so which was just talking about this, but they haven't guaranteed it, so we can't kind of complain that they aren't giving it um, yet. Um, but, but I think the question mark is bigger within Europe as when it comes to, to deterrence and fighting for an ally. And this, by the way, is why it is so important that we stand strong now uh, behind Ukraine, even though, of course, Ukraine is not a NATO member, member state. But, but you do have this element of, you know, you need to show unity um, so that you don't need it in the end, right? I mean, that is, that is kind of what, what deterrence is. Um, I mean, to answer your, your, your very specific, very clearly, I mean, right now, we don't have the same deterrent, and certainly not nuclear deterrent coming out of Paris than we 
do have or and did have coming out of Washington. But that you can't, you know, reproach the French because again, like, you know, we're only starting to talk about a nuclear um, deterrent um, uh, in Europe right now. Uh, I don't know whether you want me to go through the kind of Weimar Triangle question now, but I think you wanted to go back to the panel first. Well, you can say a sentence on the Weimar Dreieck because then Lucas will have the last word. On the, on the, the, the Weimar Triangle, um, I absolutely think that, you know, the, the, the Weimar Triangle would be and is the right way of moving forward on many things in Europe. I mean, if you get... If, if you get France, Germany and Poland to agree on anything, that's, you know, when you get most of the voices in Europe already, you can kind of unify pretty much everybody behind them. So that would be super useful. And um, you kind of said that this was an established format. I think you said eingespieltes format. Honestly, it's not anymore. Um, primarily because of, you know, previous Polish governments that has changed now. So I think now's the time to revive the Weimar Triangle. I'm, I'm definitely for it. Um, I think the Polish government is very busy doing other things at the moment, but but hopefully um, we can go back to this. And I know, I mean, let's put it this way, because we talked a lot about France. A lot of people in Europe are still very, very skeptical when it comes to France's position, right? I mean, France is seen, I mean, A, as kind of NATO critical, and then seems to be a bit um, alien to kind of Eastern European thinking. And to be honest, I think a lot of this has changed. And I, what I definitely experienced is a huge effort in Paris by French foreign policy people to understand, especially Eastern Europe better, and to become a more kind of European nation rather than just a Western uh, European nation. So I think there's definite willingness to, to reach out and to do more. And therefore, again, Weimar, Weimar Triangle, definitely something I would I would support. And I hope the Germans would be on board. I think they, they would be so... Um, yeah, let's do it. Thank you, Ulrike. Uh, Thank you very much, Ulrike and Lukas. We are running out of time. Maybe just a brief statement on the Weimar Dreieck or <coughs> on the question of dying for Gdansk, yes or no? Yeah, the easy questions at the end. <laughs> uh, so um, on Weimar Triangle, actually, that's a very easy answer because uh, the efforts to revive the cooperation are ongoing. Uh, it's actually a little bit of a Polish week here in Berlin because we had uh, Minister Sikorski, uh, we had uh, the delegation of the parliamentarians, uh, and in all these uh, meetings, the revival of Weimar Triangle was, I think, second after all the issues of the bilateral relations between Poland and Germany. And the similar messages go uh, also between Poland uh, and, uh, and, and Paris. So uh, the revival itself, I think it's easy to be done and uh, just wait at the beginning of February. Uh, in the first part of February, there should be a meeting at the level of foreign ministers as well to kind of officially relaunch it uh, under the, the, the new political uh, circumstances. And yes, there is a much bigger cohesion in terms of our views on European security, on Ukraine, on Russia. Uh, so there is a common agenda, which would not be just about security on defense, but I think the security on defense would be uh, there. The issues of the reform and deepening and broadening of the European Union that was discussed in the morning, that's one of the areas that if we can get our three countries together, I would not say it will resolve everything because each European Union member would have their own uh, opinion, but it could uh, help uh, to push things through. So I think I'm very optimistic about Weimar Triangle, but please do not come back immediately to some ideas of a Weimar main battle tank. That would be the road to disaster. Um, on uh, the, the issue of the credibility of the Terrans uh, and uh, who cares for which uh, city, it's ultimately the question about the level of our uh, interconnectedness. And I'm not saying in the economic sense, I'm saying in the political, strategic, maybe also emotional sense. So do we see ourselves as part of the same political and strategic community? If we do, then of course uh, we are bound to support 
and help each other. And of course, you have the instruments, NATO, European Union, bilateral, trilateral issues that help us do that. But ultimately, it's the question of whether we see ourselves as us or, or not. I think, by the way, Ukraine is in the process of going from being them outside people who, of course, we like, support, uh, maybe uh, feel sorry about, to being part of our community, to being us. Uh, that's why we invited them to join the European Union. And if we really mean that, uh, that means that Ukraine also becomes uh, part of this uh, political and strategic uh, community uh, that we would be bound uh, to protect. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Lukas. Thank you very much, Lukas. Das waren jetzt, das waren jetzt zwei sehr These were two very intensive hours, and I think we all deserve a break. And this is what you get. And when you go one flight of stairs down, you will get some food and something to drink. And what you can also do is um, in the hallway, find a video installation on the feminist foreign policy, as it has been mentioned by our um, office in Washington. And yeah, well, relax. And we will meet again in one hour. Thank you very much to Ulrike Frank in Paris, Sergio Lagodinsky and Lukas Kules here.